Sunday, May 28, 1978. At approximately 8.45 p.m., Jeffrey Lee Scott and his girlfriend, Karen Lynn Noble, leave Karen's home in Bluefield, West Virginia. No one knows precisely where the young couple is headed, but it is known that they often enjoy driving along sparsely populated Route 61 in neighboring Virginia, a trek which carries them from Bland to Giles County. It is Memorial Day weekend, and the start of a new summertime is before them. Sadly, neither of them would live to enjoy the coming season. Sometime between 10 and 11.30 p.m., the lives of both Jeffrey Scott and Karen Noble were cut tragically short. Today, the precise events of that warm, balmy evening remain a mystery. of Jeff Scott and Karen Noble remain the subject of both conversation and debate. No one was ever charged, much less convicted, of having caused their deaths, and some feel that the hand of justice has already exerted its punishment by claiming the life of a prime suspect who died by his own hand two years after the double tragedy. The mystery surrounding the deaths of Jeff Scott and Karen Noble seems to hinge on a 90-minute window of lost time, an hour and a half during which their fates were sealed. Just what transpired during this time period remains the subject of conjecture. Given the gruesome and brutal nature of the crime, many find this to be a status quo that is absolutely unacceptable. Jeffrey Scott and Karen Noble were born within a year of one another, Jeff in 1957 and Karen in 1958. Both would grow to adulthood in the southern coal fields of West Virginia. Jeff was described as being a natural photographer who loved playing basketball and would go out of his way to help just about anyone. Karen was a Dean's List student who loved cheerleading and playing the dulcimer. According to her friends, she was almost always exuberant and happy, the kind of person who just naturally made you want to smile. Jeff graduated from Bramwell High School in 1975, Karen from Bluefield High School in 1976. In May of 1978, they were each attending Marshall University in Huntington, West Virginia. Karen was majoring in geology, Jeff in accounting. They had been exclusively dating one another for around four years. Those who knew them said they were very much in love and enjoyed a delightful relationship. Jeff and Karen had each returned to their respective homes in Bramwell and Bluefield in May of 1978. Both were looking forward to their impending summer vacation. Neither would live to see the change of seasons. At some point on the night of May 28, 1978, something went horribly awry, and the lives of the young, loving couple were murderously cut short. May 28, 1978 was a Sunday, and the second day of what, for most, was a three-day weekend, which signaled the traditional beginning of the good old summertime. It was a day of fun, leisure, and spectacle. Across the United States, millions fired up the backyard grills, patronized the swimming pools, and tuned in to the sound of roaring engines and squealing tires from Indianapolis. Sadly, the downside of the revelry would also make its presence known. 
Drugs, alcohol, and long-distance driving would invariably lead to a high number of vehicular accidents and drunken brawls. Jeffrey Scott spent at least part of his Sunday jogging and playing basketball with several of his friends in Bramwell. Karen Noble was due to return with her parents from a nine-day family excursion to Kansas. According to Karen's parents, Jeff showed up at her Bluefield, West Virginia home at approximately 8.45 p.m. Not long thereafter, she and Jeff drove off for a late-night date, but reportedly did not tell anyone exactly where they were planning to go. In 1978, Karen Noble lived here, at 316 Parkway Street in the town of Bluefield, West Virginia. Karen's parents later advised that the couple drove away from the home at approximately 8.50 p.m., just as the sun was beginning to set. They assumed that Karen and Jeff were headed for Route 61 in Virginia, a rural country road which parallels Wolf Creek. Karen and Jeff were known to frequent the area as they reportedly had a peaked interest in log homes and cabins. The exact route or routes taken by the couple that night is not known with certainty, However, it is generally accepted that they would have left Karen's home in Bluefield, driven east on U.S. Route 46 and 52, continued along onto the Cumberland Road, turned onto and proceeded south on Interstate 77, crossed into Virginia by way of the East River Mountain Tunnel, and then turned east along Virginia Route 61. This section of their supposed route of travel would have taken them approximately 15 minutes depending on the traffic and lights. The area in question is situated in the southwest extension of the Commonwealth of Virginia, a primarily mountainous region which is bisected north to south by Interstate 77. From I-77, Virginia Route 61 continues in an easterly by northeasterly course crossing from Bland County into Giles County and terminating at the small community of Narrows, Virginia. The countryside along the way is rural and sparsely to lightly populated by small homes, farmhouses, and cabins. The region has changed precious little in the last 42 years. Even today, this lonely stretch of roadway is lightly traveled and poorly lit for most of its length. Karen and Jeff were next seen at approximately 9.15 p.m. According to Mr. Robert Lauder, a Bluefield resident who was staying in his Bland County cabin, he observed Jeff Scott's blue 1977 Datsun pickup truck pull off Route 61 to a picnic table located on the property just to the east. He observed a young man and woman fitting the description of Karen Noble and Jeff Scott exit the vehicle and proceed on foot through a wooded area and towards Wolf Creek. Louder noted that the pickup truck had a West Virginia license plate. Approximately one hour later, between 10 and 10.15 p.m., Mr. Louder again came out of his cabin to secure a chain gate across his access road. He observed that the Dotson pickup was still parked near the picnic table and facing east on Route 61. As he was securing the chain, Louder noted what he later described as three shadows emerged from the woods and walk over to the parked truck. Due to the darkness, Louder was unable to make a positive identification. He did, however, observe two of the figures enter the truck one from the driver's side and one from the passenger side, and take seats behind the wheel and in the center. At about this time, a vehicle approached from the east and shone its headlights onto the truck. Louder noted that the third figure, who was standing on the passenger side of the truck, slouched and leaned behind the truck's windshield pillar as if he were trying to keep out of view. Around the same time, another vehicle approached from the west. 
The figure behind the truck's steering wheel put his foot on the brake pedal, causing the brake lights to flash. The eastbound vehicle sounded its horn in response. Once both vehicles had passed, the third figure entered the pickup, which then drove east along Route 61 at what Mr. Lauder described as a leisurely pace. Approximately 90 minutes later, and just over two miles to the east, 20-year-old Timothy Vaughn and his girlfriend were driving westbound on Route 61. As he came out of a left-hand turn, Vaughn noticed a burning fire ahead along a gravel, half-moon-shaped turnoff on the southern side of the road. Knowing the location was the site of a county-owned dumpster, Vaughn pulled his vehicle off the road to investigate the flames. As he pulled his car to a stop, Vaughn noticed that the flames were coming from the cab of a pickup truck parked at an angle a few feet off the road. Its tailgate and passenger side door were both hanging open. After alighting from his vehicle, Vaughn approached the burning pickup and saw a horrendous sight. Lying in the truck's bed was the lifeless body of Jeff Scott. His head, arms, and upper trunk had been severely burned. His arms were each bent in a manner which brought his hands up to and close to his forehead a position which closely resembled a boxer's defensive stance. With the vehicle still ablaze, Vaughn ran back to his truck, advised his girlfriend to remain at the scene, and then drove westbound to the home of a friend approximately a half mile away. Upon his arrival, Vaughn advised his friend, Jamie French, about what he had seen. French himself then drove to the scene of the fire while Vaughn telephoned the Giles County Sheriff's Department. Around the same time, another westbound motorist, Alan Swoat, observed the fire and stopped to render assistance. A short time later, Tim Vaughn returned to the scene and, along with Swoat, pulled the body of Jeff Scott from the truck's bed to a safe place about 21 feet away. Shortly thereafter, police, fire, and emergency vehicles began to arrive, and the fire was soon extinguished. Virginia State Trooper F. M. Blevins was first on the scene, arriving at approximately 12.20 a.m. The date was now May 29, 1978. In the confusion, little attention had been paid to anything else except the fire. Once the flames were extinguished, a pair of woman's shoes were observed sitting on the truck's tailgate. Vaughn advised that he experienced an odd feeling when he first arrived at the scene, a feeling which turned his attention towards Wolf Creek, about 50 feet to the south. Trooper Blevins carefully made his way through the brush and towards a sandy bar along the creek. Here, he came upon the body of Karen Noble, lying face down at the water's edge. She had been shot twice in the head. Realizing now that he had a crime scene on his hands, Trooper Blevins sealed off the area and made an effort to preserve the scene. However, by this time, numerous emergency vehicles and passerbys had already crisscrossed much of the area around Jeff Scott's truck. Blevins called the Virginia State Police Detachment in Withville and requested assistance from the Division of Investigation. Investigator A.K. Metro and Chief Medical Examiner Caesar Callalung were dispatched. Callalung declared both Jeff Scott and Karen Noble dead at the scene. State Police Investigator C.G. Wyatt later arrived and took charge of the crime scene investigation. Tim Vaughn and Alan Swoat, each of whom had been driving westbound on Route 61, advised that neither had passed or been passed by any other vehicles since they left the Narrows. Authorities ascertained that Scott's truck had been parked where it was found and not forced off the roadway at a high rate of speed. The fuel door on the passenger side of the vehicle was open and the gas cap was missing. Three small bullet holes were found on the same side, 
indicating an amateurish attempt to ignite the truck's fuel tank. Curiously, while the upper third of Scott's body was badly charred, the bed of the truck where he was found was not burned, and the fire had been confined to the truck's cab. To authorities, this suggested that Scott had been killed elsewhere and then placed within the truck's bed. Jeff Scott had been shot once in the left side of his head by a twenty-two caliber long or short firearm. While his official cause of death was listed as gunshot wounds, the defensive position of his arms made it difficult to tell whether or not he had been set afire before or after he had been shot. When he was found, Jeff Scott was wearing only a pair of blue jeans and no shirt. His brown belt was found rolled up in the bed of the truck. Karen Noble had been shot twice in the head by a twenty two caliber weapon. However, each of the bullet wounds were superficial and not considered to have been fatal. No other wounds, defensive or otherwise, were found. An autopsy later revealed both water and sand in her lungs and nose, indicating drowning as the likely cause of her death. Karen was found still clad in her green floral pattern blouse and multicolored floral pattern skirt. It was later determined that intercourse had occurred not long before her death. However, it did not appear that a rape or assault had occurred. Large amounts of mud and sand in her clothing, a cockle burr in her hair, and shallow grooves along the ground indicated that Karen's body had been removed from the truck and dragged to the location where it was found. The medical examiner determined that Karen was likely unconscious when she entered the water. No powder burns or residue were found around any of the bullet wounds, indicating that the shots may have been fired from as far away as three feet or more. The clothing worn by each of the victims was tested but showed no signs of having come in contact with a petroleum-based substance. Eerily, the bodies of both Jeff Scott and Karen Noble appeared to speak volumes about their own deaths. Each was wearing a wristwatch when they were found. The hands of Jeff Scott's calendar watch had come to a stop at 11.02 p.m. The date erroneously read Monday, May 28th, when the 28th was, in fact, a Sunday. The hands on Karen Noble's watch had come to a stop at 11.25 p.m. A 22 caliber slug was removed from each of the victim's skulls. However, both were too mutilated and deformed to permit a full ballistics examination. Three additional 22 caliber slugs or fragments were also recovered from the scene. The presence of six spent rounds and the absence of any shell casings or hulls led authorities to conclude that the weapon used was likely a revolver of some kind. Despite a rigorous search by both air and ground, no firearm believed to have been the murder weapon was found in the area around the crime scene. Jeff Scott's wallet containing his driver's license was missing, along with the gas cap to his 1977 Datsun pickup. Neither have ever been found, and may have been taken from the scene by the killer as a kind of trophy. Other evidence at the scene indicated that the killer may also have taken some form of trophy from Karen Noble. Traces of blood were found in various places around the scene. In particular, Type O blood was noted on the truck's bumper, Type A on the truck's tailgate, and Type AB on Jeff Scott's belt. Karen Noble was determined to have been blood type ARH positive. Jeff Scott was determined to be type ABRH positive. The origin of the Type O blood on the truck's bumper has never been determined. However, it was theorized it could have belonged to the assailant, who may possibly have been injured by one of his own bullets ricocheting off the truck's gas tank. 
Although open to interpretation, the cumulative effect of the evidence found at the scene indicated that both Jeff and Karen had been killed elsewhere and later transferred to the location where they were found. Based upon the progress of the fire in Jeff's truck, authorities later determined that the killer may have still been present at the crime scene perhaps as few as five minutes prior to Timothy Vaughn's arrival. Jeff Scott's vehicle was found in this general position, pointed north and a little to the east at a slightly downward angle. Authorities later stressed that the truck did not appear to have crashed or been forced off the roadway, but had been deliberately parked where it was found. Although damaged by the flames, the truck had sustained no physical or structural damage as a result of its pulling off the roadway. Investigators remained at the crime scene until well past sunrise. In addition to Virginia and Giles County, authorities from Bluefield, West Virginia, as well as the West Virginia State Police, joined in the subsequent investigation. Initially, the investigation focused on friends and family of the victims, most of whom lived either in Bluefield or the surrounding area. Authorities refused to elaborate on whether those whom they were questioning were either suspects or potential witnesses. This abundance of caution may have precipitated another near tragedy. Rumors concerning the double murder spread rapidly through Bluefield. At one point early in the investigation, an old friend of Karen Nobles was reportedly mentioned as a possible suspect. When word reached this individual about their potential involvement, they attempted to take their own life. Not long thereafter, investigation revealed that the person in question had been in Withville, Virginia before the estimated time of the murder. The individual was later eliminated as a suspect. The early flourish of information which made its way into the press reports alarmed Giles County Sheriff John Hopkins, who soon found himself fending off false and unfounded rumors. Some reports speculated that Scott's truck had been forced off the road. Another rumor circulated that another vehicle had been at the crime scene prior to Tim Vaughn's arrival. In exasperation, Sheriff Hopkins was quoted as saying, quote, We can't release all the details, or we might as well lay our entire case on the table, end quote. The first major break in the investigation came when Giles County authorities were contacted by Robert Lauder, the Bluefield resident who was staying at his Bland County cabin on the night of May 28th. As it turned out, Lauder had another visitor that evening, one who had left a far more vivid impression. Lauder advised investigators that he was outside of his cabin along Route 61 between 7 and 7.30 p.m. when an unidentified white male approached his cabin on foot. Lauder and this visitor talked for the next hour or so. The mysterious man told Lauder that he lived in nearby Rocky Gap, Virginia, and was on his way home. Lauder noted that the man's left leg was stiff, and that his left arm was bent. The visitor stated that he had been injured by a smoke bomb while in the armed services, and that he had actually spent the last nine months or so in a VA hospital. The man added that he did not get along with most people as they often laughed at him because of his disability. Mr. Lauder became nervous when the man advised that he was something of a people watcher. He indicated that he would often sit on the open hillside across from Lauder's property and observe the people who would stop at the picnic table just off the eastern edge of his property line. While he was talking, the man smoked a number of unfiltered Camel brand cigarettes, later discarding the butts in the same general area. The man made mention of a local family named Hamilton, whom he stated were responsible for the vehicular death of his wife and father. Although not referring to himself, the man made mention of the name Mulkey, 
and said something about pine seedlings and stolen fishing reels. Louder reported that he grew gradually more and more nervous about his visitor, but was afraid to anger him, fearing that the result would be dangerous for either himself or his family. The man eventually stated that he had better leave, as he had a two-mile walk ahead of him. Mr. Louder offered to give the man a ride home, but this offer was declined. Louder advised that he kept a close eye on the man as he walked away to the west and did not avert his gaze until he was out of sight. Robert Louder provided authorities with a detailed physical description of this unknown male. Using an identikit, these composite and hand-drawn sketches of the man were created. He was estimated to have been in his mid-thirties, stood five feet seven inches tall, weighed between 150 and 160 pounds, and had light brown or blonde hair, which was short and neatly combed. He was wearing a brown long sleeve corduroy shirt, green or light blue twill work pants, and brogan-type shoes. He also carried a long, well-used walking stick, and louder noted a pint of vodka in his rear pocket. The man walked with a limp, indicating a stiff left leg, and his left arm was bent in an unusual manner. Louder advised that he had never seen the man before. Cigarette butts dropped by the unknown male were recovered from the Louder property and later analyzed. The cabin formerly owned by Robert Louder is located here, between Route 61 and Wolf Creek. The bodies of Jeff Scott and Karen Noble, along with Scott's burning truck, were found here in a dirt and gravel turnaround just over two miles to the east. This location was also the site of a Giles County-owned dumpster. In 1978, the verge between Route 61 and Wolf Creek was far less thick and led to a sandy beach or bar, which was popular among local teenagers and fishermen. At the time, there were no residences or other burning buildings which had a direct line of sight to either the dumpster or the beach. Seeking confirmation of Louder's account, authorities next interviewed his first neighbor to the west along Route 61. The owner of the home stated that she had indeed observed the man in question walking westbound on Route 61 at approximately 8.30 p.m. on the same day, a time which coincided with Mr. Louder's account. The homeowner also expressed some concern over the man's presence and stated that she was relieved when he walked away. The same woman also advised that her daughter arrived home about 30 minutes later, having driven east on Route 61 from Rocky Gap. She advised that she had not seen the individual in question. The account of the first witness was confirmed by her mother, who lived in the home next to hers. The mother stated that she too had been alarmed by the man's presence and appearance. While they could not say so publicly, authorities privately felt they had an inkling of who the unknown man might be. Bolstering their suspicions, reports had come in which indicated that an unoccupied farmhouse about a half mile from the louder cabin had been entered and briefly occupied by an unidentified male. Authorities searched the farmhouse in question and discovered an additional cache of camel cigarette butts. Curiously, the cigarettes had been smoked to the same length as those recovered at the Louder property, one inch from the end. Theorizing that the suspect may be hiding out along the hillside to the west and north of Route 61, the state police helicopter, along with tracking dogs, were dispatched. Several days searching turned up no trace of the yet unidentified man. Despite the initial enthusiasm expressed during the investigation's early days, by June 14th, authorities were forced to publicly state that they were stumped. Again, it was later learned that they did have a person of interest in mind, but had no evidence conclusive enough to justify naming him. 
Authorities would continue on without any such justification for the next 10 months. On March 31, 1979, the region was again shaken by another seemingly senseless act of violence. That day, in a scenario eerily similar to that of the Scott Noble murders, 21-year-old Samuel Davis Smith and his 15-year-old girlfriend pulled into the parking lot of John's Motel and Restaurant in Tazewell, Virginia. Finding the restaurant too crowded, they returned to their car, where they were accosted and then kidnapped at gunpoint by a white male whom neither of them recognized. Smith was forced to drive his 1971 Buick east on U.S. Route 460 and then east again on Route 61. Shortly after setting out, the kidnapper attempted to rape Smith's young girlfriend. The kidnapper's apparent intentions were thwarted when Smith deliberately crashed his vehicle into a nearby gas station. The kidnapper shot at Smith with a 22 caliber revolver, striking him in the head. The wound, however, was superficial and a vicious struggle ensued. Smith eventually overpowered the kidnapper and got possession of the revolver. The would-be rapist immediately fled on foot. Smith and his girlfriend were later treated at a local hospital and released. The weapon taken from the assailant was a cheap six-shot 22 caliber double-action revolver manufactured in Germany. Though in poor condition, it was still functional. It was later ascertained that the importation of this firearm had ceased after the passage of the 1968 Gun Control Act. Authorities again felt they knew who the offender was, however, they would only publicly describe him as a fugitive who had escaped from the Giles County Jail while awaiting trial on rape charges. This description, however, proved to all but positively identify the unnamed suspect. Authorities, therefore, soon made the man's name public and also revealed that he was a suspect in the murder of Jeff Scott and Karen Noble. The fugitive from justice was identified as 32-year-old George Byrd, formerly of Bland County, Virginia. The life saga of George Byrd could easily comprise an entire feature of its own. Byrd was first arrested in 1965 and convicted in 1967 for the rape of a six-year-old girl. Byrd served five years of a 20-year sentence in the state penitentiary before being paroled in 1972. He was again convicted in 1973 for the assault of a 21-year-old woman in Giles County and served one year in the county jail. In late 1976, Byrd was arrested and charged with the rape of a woman in the Mountain Lake area of Giles County. Byrd was held in the Giles County Jail while awaiting trial. In a scene that must have resembled a cliché Hollywood film, Byrd managed to escape from the county jail in February of 1977 after his girlfriend smuggled a hacksaw hidden inside of a cake into Byrd's cell. Byrd was therefore on the lam when Jeff Scott and Karen Noble were murdered. The possible connection to the murders of Jeff Scott and Karen Noble soon became obvious. The home where Byrd's mother and brother resided was located here, on Route 61, directly between the Robert Lauder property and the Scott Noble crime scene. Authorities, however, were split on whether or not Byrd was actually responsible for both the Scott Noble murders and the Taswell kidnapping. In particular, it was noted that several aspects of the attack on Karen Noble did not fit Byrd's previous modus operandi. Unlike his two previous convictions and arrest, Karen had been neither beaten nor raped. On the other hand, several other aspects of the two crimes were eerily similar. The caliber of weapon used was the same. Byrd had briefly taken possession of Smith's wallet and driver's license. Jeff Scott's wallet and driver's license were never found. Both incidents involved a drive along Route 61 
and in each case the man believed to have been Byrd was reported as having stated that he, quote, hated everybody, end quote. Smith and his girlfriend were later shown a photograph of George Byrd and positively identified him as the assailant. The implications were frighteningly clear. Southwest Virginia had just jumped from the frying pan into the fire. The mood of the region, already on edge following the unsolved Scott Noble murders, soon boiled over into anger. In a letter to Virginia Governor John Dalton, a Bramwell, West Virginia resident, openly accused Virginia authorities of dragging their feet because Scott and Noble were residents of West Virginia and not Virginia. Perhaps in response to this rebuke, Virginia authorities privately began to pull out all the stops in their pursuit of George Byrd. Feeling confident that Byrd was hiding in or in the vicinity of his mother's Bland County home, an extensive surveillance operation was soon set up. Hoping to catch Byrd in the open, authorities established a viewing post atop the hillside directly opposite the house in question. After two false starts, resulting in failed attempts at apprehension, Virginia authorities finally caught a break. On the morning of August 19, 1979, authorities at the viewing post observed Byrd entering his mother's home. Constant surveillance on the home was maintained as a force of 35 or more law enforcement officers descended en masse and quickly surrounded the house. Despite furious efforts by Byrd's mother and brother to prevent their entrance, authorities eventually made their way inside the house and soon discovered Byrd hidden beneath some insulation in the attic with the barrel of a 30-30 rifle tucked beneath his chin. A tense two hours of negotiations ensued. Authorities eventually managed to talk Byrd down by threatening the use of tear gas. He was taken into custody and transported to the maximum security section of the Giles County Jail, the same section from which he had escaped in 1977. On May 21, 1980, George Byrd was convicted of the original charges brought against him in 1976 and sentenced to life plus 120 years. George Byrd, however, would not serve a single day of his sentence. That night, he took his own life by hanging himself with a sheet in his Russell County jail cell. To the end, Byrd denied any involvement in the murders of Jeff Scott and Karen Noble. Giles County Commonwealth Attorney Hezekiah Osborne had previously refused to present a case against Byrd to a grand jury based on the little information available at the time. With Byrd's death, Interest in the double murder quickly faded from the headlines, as well as many local memories. Jeff Scott's father, former Bramwell Mayor Glenn Scott, passed away in 1996. Kara Noble's parents, William and Elizabeth, passed away within three months of one another in 2007. Just over 30 years would pass before the Scott Noble murders were again brought into the public light. During the intervening years, Timothy Vaughn, the young man who had first discovered Scott's burning truck, began his own career in law enforcement. Around 1988, Vaughn began to quietly review the Scott Noble murders and gradually took the case under his own wing on an unofficial basis. In 2010, former area resident Eric Noli created the now-defunct website wolfcreekmurders.com, which currently can only be viewed via the Wayback Machine. Nolly provided visitors with a brief synopsis of the crime, several photos and contemporary newspaper articles, along with short biographies of both Jeff Scott and Karen Noble. The website apparently sparked a renewed interest in the 30-plus-year-old crime. The following year, the Bluefield Daily Telegraph, as part of a series of stories on local cold cases, published an extensive essay entitled The Age of Innocence Lost, a detailed account of both the murders and the ensuing search for prime suspect George Byrd. 
Following publication, numerous online forums providing a place for open discussion of the cold case soon appeared. Posts to these various sites continue to this day. Forty-two years later, the murder of Jeffrey Scott and Karen Noble remain unsolved and officially inactive. As homicide cases, they will never truly close entirely. However, Mysterious WV has been informed that the cases will, in all likelihood, only be moved from inactive to active should another viable suspect be named. The debate of whether or not George Byrd was responsible for the double murder continues. Many remain convinced of his guilt. Others, however, are not so easily swayed. As long as there remain questions to be answered, it seems reasonable to assume that this decades-old case will continue to puzzle and intrigue. Jeffrey Lee Scott and Karen Lynn Noble were both laid to rest on Wednesday, May 31, 1978. Karen in the Roselawn Memorial Gardens in Princeton and Jeff in the Woodlawn Memorial Park Cemetery in Bluewell, West Virginia. Their modest memorials remain lovingly tended to this day, more than 42 years after their young lives were tragically cut short. Truly, a genuine loss of innocence. Time has taken a deep toll on the family and friends of Jeff Scott and Karen Noble. A constant lack of answers has left some of them disillusioned and with little appetite to pursue the matter further. Out of respect for this expressed desire, Mysterious WV made no effort to contact any members of either family, and we respectfully ask that you, as viewers, do likewise. However, for people like Timothy Vaughn and other members of law enforcement who were touched by the tragedy, the incident is not so easy to relinquish. Vaughn, in particular, feels that there are still avenues to be pursued, which, with some skill and a little luck, might just shed some additional light on this moribund case. If George Byrd was indeed the guilty party, then there still exists the need for proof. If George Byrd was not responsible, then the stakes are even higher. For that would mean that a cold-blooded murderer may have been roaming free in society for over 42 years. Again, for many, a status quo which is wholly unacceptable. Perhaps you hold some answers to this decades-old enigma. Please pay close attention to the following summation. Jeff Scott and Karen Noble are believed to have been killed between 10 and 11.30 p.m on Sunday, May 28, 1978. The pair left Karen's home in Bluefield, West Virginia at approximately 8.50 p.m. Jeff was driving a blue 1977 Datsun pickup truck, West Virginia license plate B340-261. Authorities are not 100% certain just which route the pair took that night, However, the most direct route to the location where they were next seen is as follows. East along U.S. routes 460 and 52 and then the Cumberland Road, merge onto I-77 south through the East River Mountain Tunnel, exit off I-77, and then east along Virginia Route 61 towards the Giles County line and Narrows, Virginia. That night, Jeff Scott was wearing a pair of blue jeans with a brown belt. Karen Noble was attired in a green floral print blouse and a multicolored floral print skirt. Both were wearing wristwatches. They were next reported seen by Bland County resident Robert Lauder, approximately here. Lauder observed a blue Datsun pickup parked just east of his cabin. Two figures, believed to have been Jeff and Karen, exited the truck and walked south through some woods towards Wolf Creek. Sometime between 10 and 10.15 p.m., Louder observed the outlines of three figures exit the woods in the same area, enter the pickup, 
and drive east at a leisurely pace. At approximately 11.50 p.m., Jeff Scott's pickup was found at this location, just over two miles to the east of the Robert Lauder property. The cab of the truck was in flames, and Jeff's lifeless body was lying in the truck's bed. The upper third of Jeff's body had been badly burned. Curiously, the bed of the truck itself had not been damaged by the fire. Jeff had also been shot once in the left side of the head by a 22 caliber bullet. He was not wearing a shirt when he was found, and his brown belt had been removed and was lying beside him in the truck bed. Karen Noble was found lying face down along the bank of Wolf Creek about 50 feet away. She had been shot twice in the head, also with a 22 caliber bullet, However, both wounds were superficial. Death was caused by drowning. There was no indication of a rape or sexual assault. Karen's wristwatch had come to stop at 11.25 p.m., Jeff's at 11.02 p.m. Authorities believe that both were either killed or knocked unconscious elsewhere and later driven to where their bodies were found. A crude attempt had been made to completely burn Jeff's truck. The gas cap had been removed, and three 22 caliber rounds had been fired at the truck's gas tank. The tank had not been punctured. Traces of type A and AB blood was found at the scene, matching the blood types of the victims. However, type O blood was found on the truck's front bumper. The source of this third blood type remains unknown, but authorities conjecture that it may belong to the killer who could have been injured by a bullet ricocheting off the truck. The prime suspect in the killings was Bland County native George Byrd. Byrd was captured the following year after kidnapping a couple in Tazewell, Virginia and attempting to rape a 15-year-old girl. Bird died by his own hand in the Russell County, Virginia jail on May 21, 1980. Bird may have been seen by Robert Lauder at his cabin on Route 61 the same night as the murders. Lauder was visited that evening by an unidentified male walking westbound. Lauder recalled that this man was in his mid-thirties, stood five feet seven inches tall, weighed between 150 and 160 pounds, and had light brown or dirty blonde hair, which was short and neatly combed. He was wearing a brown, long-sleeved corduroy shirt, green or light blue twill work pants, and brogan-type shoes. He also carried a long, well-used walking stick, and Louder also noted a pint of vodka in the man's rear pocket. The man walked with a limp, indicating a stiff left leg, and his left arm was bent in an unusual manner. Lauder advised that he had never seen the man before. Authorities would be very interested in speaking to anyone who may have seen Jeff Scott, Karen Noble, or possibly even George Byrd on the night of May 28, 1978, along Route 61 in Bland and Giles County, Virginia. They would also like to locate the gas cap to Jeff Scott's 1978 Datsun pickup, as well as his wallet and West Virginia driver's license, which may have been taken by the killer as a trophy. Authorities also feel that a form of trophy, very personal in nature, may also have been taken from Karen Noble. If you have any information concerning the murders of Jeff Scott and Karen Noble, please contact either the Giles County, Virginia Sheriff's Department at 540-921-3842 or the Whitfield Detachment of the Virginia State Police at the telephone number or email address listed below.
Thank you.